I am proud of you. Only a small percentage of people in the world get through any sort of calculus course, but you have made it. You've pushed through calculus one and calculus two and possibly even calculus three to get to differential equations. But I also know a lot of you did it during the pandemic. I don't think anybody can really argue that instruction during the pandemic has been anything that would be called consistent. So today I want to go through and I just want to sit down and talk to you about several integration strategies that come from calculus two. And we're going to be using these integration techniques to solve a lot of differential equations. They will rear their head time and again in various forms all throughout the course. So I want to just take this say 20 minutes to half an hour and just run through each one of these different integration strategies. This includes U substitution, integration by parts, trigonometric substitution, partial fraction decomposition. And hopefully, once we get through these, you'll feel a little bit more prepared for what's coming ahead. And so why don't we go ahead and get started? Okay. So why don't we go ahead and start with the easiest one, and this is U-substitution. U-substitution is something you learned back in Calculus 1 and is basically a way of reversing the chain rule. So essentially what you do is you take a look at an equation, say the integral of x times e to the x squared, dx. And your objective is to identify a function u inside of the integral where the derivative of u also appears. So in this case, we see that x squared would be a good candidate for u because we have an x in there. Now, x isn't exactly the derivative of u, it is half of it, but constants are something we can end up working with. So what we do then is we go ahead and we set u is equal to x squared, take the derivative of both sides, gives us du is equal to 2x dx, then we divide by 2x. So ultimately we have that du over 2x is equal to dx. Now what we're going to do is we're going to change the integral and we're going to replace x squared with u and we're going to replace dx with du over 2x. And you'll see that the x's actually end up canceling out and what we're left with is the integral only in terms of u. And so when this happens, you know you were successful. And since this is just the integral of e to the u divided by 2, we know that the integral is going to be e to the u over 2 plus c. And then we just replace u with x squared, and then we have e to the x squared divided by 2 plus c. So that's the really easy example of, say, u substitution. But it can come up in a lot of places that you might not expect. So for instance, if we take a look at the integral of secant of t dt, this uses u substitution in a way that's really subtle. So what we need to do is we need to multiply by 1. And to do this, we multiply and divide by secant of t plus tangent of t divided by secant of t plus tangent of t. We can distribute the secant of t through the top and we get secant squared of t plus secant of t times tangent of t divided by secant of t plus tangent of t dt. And what's really interesting here is that we know that the derivative of secant of t is secant t tangent t and we know that the derivative of tangent t is secant squared of t. And well that means that on the top there we actually have the derivative of what's on the bottom. And so if we go ahead and use u substitution where we take that entire bottom quantity and set that as u, this is the integral of 1 over u du, and then that becomes the natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. And we can finish this out by replacing u with its definition. So now we have the natural log of the absolute value of secant of t plus tangent of t, and this quantity plus c. So that is u substitution and two good examples. Now let's go ahead and jump into trigonometric substitution, which sort of turns this whole thing on its head. So trigonometric substitution uses this diagram. And the whole idea is that we want to exploit Pythagorean identities. So here we have a radius of one coming out of the origin, and we put this in standard position when we have an angle. So we have this theta, and then this triangle we have is a one in the hypotenuse, sine on the opposite side, and cosine on the adjacent side. And so we know if we take sine squared plus cosine squared, then that's gonna give us the hypotenuse squared, or one. But there's also this other right triangle that's really handy. If you take the tip of that radius and you follow it along at a 90 degree angle, back to the x-axis, that's going to give you tangent of theta. And then if you take that point from the x-axis all the way back to the origin, that gives you secant of theta. And so then we see that tangent of theta squared plus 1 squared is equal to secant squared. And these are the two Pythagorean identities out of trigonometry. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to use these identities in order to come up with some nice formulas for integration. So for instance, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, 
leads to one minus sine squared is equal to cosine squared. And tangent squared plus one is equal to secant squared also means that tangent squared is equal to secant squared minus one. And what we do after this is really just a game of pattern matching. So we're going to be looking for little quadratics inside of our integrals. So for instance, we have one over the square root of one plus x squared dx. And we want to know what should we select in order to replace x to make this simpler. And there's only going to be three options. We're going to have x is equal to sine, x equal to tangent, or x equal to secant. When x equal to sine, we use that when we have one minus x squared. And we use tangent when we have one plus x squared, like we have here. And we use secant when we have one minus x squared. And when we use x equals sine of theta, that gives us dx equal to cosine of theta d theta. And when we use x equal tangent theta, we get dx is equal to secant squared of theta d theta. And finally, when we take a look at x being secant of theta, we end up getting dx is equal to secant of theta tangent of theta d theta. So why don't we go ahead and plug this in and see what we get. So we have one plus x squared in the, in the denominator inside of the radical. So I'm gonna take x is equal to tangent of theta. So that means that dx is equal to secant squared of theta d theta. I go ahead and plug this in. And so what I see now is that we have the integral of secant squared of theta d theta divided by the square root of one plus tangent squared of theta. Now that one plus tangent squared of theta gets turned into secant squared of theta, and then we take a square root, and then that's gonna leave a secant on the bottom, and that's gonna cancel with one of the secants on the top. And so this leaves us with the integral of secant of theta d theta, and then we just saw that this is gonna give us the natural log of the absolute value of secant of theta plus tangent of theta plus c. But we're not done yet. We have to go ahead and replace secant and tangent with the right quantities. And so to do this, we need to break out a right triangle. So since we said that tangent of theta is equal to x, that means that we're saying that tangent of theta is equal to x over one, or x is the opposite side of the angle on a right triangle, and one is the adjacent side. So that means that if we make a right triangle using this theta, we should be seeing something like having x, one, and the square root of one plus x coming from the Pythagorean theorem. And so now when we want to replace secant of theta inside of our natural log there, then we're gonna be looking at having the hypotenuse over the adjacent, which means that we're gonna have the square root of one plus x squared divided by one. And now tangent of theta, well, that was easy. That is actually x. That tells us that the final answer is gonna be the natural log of the absolute value of the square root of one plus x squared, that plus one, and then we're gonna add the arbitrary constant c. All right, so now we're down to another tool, and that is integration by parts. This is probably the most important integration technique that you learned in Calculus 2, and we're going to use it all the time here in differential equations. Now, in the simplest form, we write it as the integral of u dv is equal to uv minus the integral of v du. Another way to look at that is to that we're going to have the integral of g times f prime dx is equal to g times f minus the integral of g prime times f dx. And so in other words, what we're doing is we're moving the derivative off of one function onto another one at the cost of a minus sign and this extra term that pops out. The idea is that if we move derivatives off of one and onto the other, we hope that one term might say disappear. If we take a look at the integral of x squared times e to the x. So what we're going to see is that if we set u is equal to x squared, then du is going to be 2x, and that means that we're decreasing by a power. However, on the other hand, if we set dv is equal to e to the x dx, then that's just e to the x when we take a look at v. On one hand, one term is decreasing, the other term is staying the same, and this integral in particular is going to come up a lot. Then if we go ahead and use those terms, we see that the integral turns into x squared times e to the x minus the integral of 2x times e to the x dx. And now we're into round two. In round two, we're gonna select the same group of terms that came out of du as our next u. And so 2x becomes u and e to the x becomes dv. You always should stick to your guns on this. Otherwise, you're gonna undo what you just did. So in this case, we see that du becomes 2dx and we see that v is again e to the x. And so if we go ahead and carry this out, that inner term is going to become 2x e to the x minus the integral of 2 times e to the x d 
dx. Hence, then that last one is just integrated as two times e to the x. So ultimately what we're gonna end up having is we have x squared e to the x minus two x e to the x plus two e to the x plus c. And that is the 101 example of integration by parts. But there's other ways we wanna handle integration by parts and this is in solving for the integral. Now this one's a bit more complicated, so I'll skip a few steps, but let me go ahead and give you the general outline. If we take a look at the integral of sine of t times e to the 2t dt, then no matter what I choose for my u or my dv, they're not gonna actually disappear as I keep working it out. And so instead, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna select something so that we end up seeing a pattern. And the idea is if I select u is equal to sine of t, then after we've done two rounds of this, I should see sine of t come back again. And if I select dv is equal to e to the 2t dt, well, that is really only gonna be changing by a constant because if that is my dv, then my v becomes e to the 2t divided by two. And so then with my u as being sine and my du being cosine, this is gonna turn into cosine of t times e to the 2t divided by two minus the integral of cosine of t times e to the 2t divided by two dt. So then again, we stick to our guns and we select u is gonna be cosine and we're gonna select e to the 2t divided by two dt is gonna be my dv. And so in this case, that means my du is gonna be minus sine of t dt and my v is gonna be e to the 2t divided by four. So then that integral becomes cosine of t times e to the 2t divided by four minus the integral of minus sine of t times e to the 2t divided by four. And that's integrated dt. But if we go ahead and simplify this and distribute signs and all these other things, what we're gonna see is that on the left-hand side, we have the integral of sine of t times e to the 2t dt. And on the right-hand side, we have a whole bunch of other terms. And then finally, we have the integral of sine of t e to the 2t divided by four dt. Now that one over four can be pulled out of the integral. And now all it really comes down to is just solving for that particular integral, which gives you this. So that's integration by parts, that's trigonometric substitution, and that's u substitution. But there's one more important term that we need to take a look at, and that is going to be partial fraction decomposition. So now let's go ahead and talk about partial fraction decomposition. So if we start off with a simple example, one over x minus one times x minus four, we want to change this into some number divided by x minus one plus another number divided by x minus four, and those numbers we'll call a and b. And our goal is to find a and b. So what we can do is we multiply both sides by the denominator on the left. And this gives us one is equal to a times x minus four plus b times x minus one. And then if we set x is equal to four, we see that we have one is equal to a times zero plus b times three, which then simplifies to being just b is equal to one third. Then if we set x equal to one, we see that we have one is equal to a times negative three plus b times zero. And we can simplify that to be negative one third. But why don't we go ahead and make this a little bit more tricky. If we have a higher power on one of the terms in our denominator, we have to make sure that power appears in all the lower ones too, in the decomposition. So if I have one over x minus one squared times x minus three, then that turns into a over x minus one squared plus b over x minus one plus c over x minus three. Again, we multiply both sides by the denominator and we see that we get one is equal to a times x minus three plus b times x minus one times x minus three plus c times x minus one squared. And it is sometimes convenient to take derivatives here. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And so that's gonna give me zero is equal to a plus b times x minus three plus x minus one plus c times two times x minus one. And so now we have two equations that we can play with in order to figure out a, b, and c. The reason why we wanna take a derivative here is that it would be hard to distinguish b and c from the first equation. So now using the first equation, I go ahead and set x equals one. And that gives me one is equal to a times negative two plus zero plus zero again. 
and then this simplifies to being just a is equal to negative one half. Then if I take that same equation, I set x equal to three, then what I get is one is equal to zero plus zero plus c times two squared. Or in other words, I get that c is equal to one quarter. Now, if I take the second equation, I can go ahead and set x is equal to one, and I have zero is equal to negative one half, that is from a, plus b times negative two, and then plus zero. And then this simplifies to being b is equal to minus one quarter. All right, and partial fraction decompositions has one other twist to it. And the idea is that we can have irreducibles. So real polynomials break down into linear terms and quadratic terms. And sometimes you're gonna have these irreducible quadratics. So in this case, let's take a look at one over x squared plus four, that times x minus one, and we want to expand it. This time we're gonna have a linear term on our irreducible quadratic term. And so this is gonna be equal to ax plus b divided by x squared plus four. And then we're gonna add c over x minus one. Now, if you multiply both sides by the denominator on the left, what we're gonna end up finding is that one is equal to ax plus b times x minus one plus c times x squared plus four. Now, if we set x equal to one, we see that we have one is equal to zero plus c times five, which then simplifies to being just c equals one fifth. Then if we set x equal to zero, we can eliminate that a term. And what we have is one is equal to b times negative one plus one fifth times four, where that one fifth came from that c we just determined. And then this tells us that b is equal to negative one fifth. Now, what we can do after this is we could actually take the derivative and do that whole game we did before in order to find a, but we can actually do something else too. If I were to multiply all the terms on the right hand side, I could see that the quadratic term on the right hand side is only going to have two pieces, one coming from a and one coming from c. So the quadratic on the right hand side has a coefficient on x squared of a plus c. But on the left hand side, we don't have x squared at all. So our coefficient there is just going to be zero. So then we see that a plus c must then be equal to zero. And that tells us that a is equal to minus c. And then that means that a is equal to minus one fifth. And then that's more or less how you do partial fraction decomposition. Now, of course, I haven't done any integration here. And, and the whole idea of partial fraction decomposition is that it's actually an algebraic technique that allows you to turn your integrand into simpler integrals. And you're left with things like the integral of one over x minus one, which then would become the natural log of the absolute value of x minus one plus c, or you could have something like the integral of one over x squared plus four. That would turn into one half of arctangents of x plus c. And well, there you go. And so that gives you a rundown of the integration techniques that come from, say, calculus two. And these are the ones that are going to be used throughout differential equations in, say, separable differential equations or the Laplace transform or many other places. Of course, there's more to calculus two than just what I put down in 30 minutes, but I hope this helps jog your memory. In any case, so thank you for watching and remember, I am proud of you.